My name is Mark Siegler, and on behalf of the McLean Center for, Clini for Clinical Medical Ethics, I welcome you to today's lecture, uh, the third in our seminar series on ethical issues in healthcare reform. Um, some of you remember that last week Mark McClellan spoke about next steps for healthcare reform. And I do want to mention that next Wednesday, uh, the Dean of the Biological Sciences Division, Dr. Kenneth Polanski, will be speaking on the topic, how healthcare reform will affect the mission of University of Chicago Medicine. Uh, I would encourage you all to attend the Dean's talk next week. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce you uh, to our speaker, Casey Mulligan, Professor of Economics here at the University of Chicago. Uh, Professor Mulligan and I met uh, sort of in the traditional University of Chicago way um, when we sat on a university committee together. Uh, it was a great opportunity to learn about Professor Mulligan and his work. Uh, Professor Mulligan is affiliated uh, with the National Bureau of Economic Research, with the George Stigler Center for the Study of the Economy and the State, and with the Population Research Center. You may know him as a frequent contributor to the economics blog in the New York Times at newyorktimes.com, and also a contributor uh, to the op-ed pages of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Professor Mulligan's interests include the study of transmission of economic status from one generation to the next, social security, aging, retirement, wage inequality between men and women, capital and labor taxation, and the economics of aging. For his outstanding work in the field of economics, Professor Mulligan has been granted numerous awards and fellowships, including those from the National Science Foundation, the Alfred Sloan Foundation, uh, the Smith Richardson Foundation, and the John Olin Foundation. Today, Professor Mulligan will speak to us on the topic, Affordable Care and the Labor Market. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Mulligan. We're on a, a committee together, and uh, we're one of several committees concerned with uh, retaining employees and turnover, compensation of employees, and uh, that's what I want to talk about today on a, on a national level, not just in our own little community here. So I'm going to show you a few results. Is that better? Better. Say that again. Yeah, my, uh, Mark and I, he mentioned we we're on a committee together. I, he didn't mention the topic, though, was about uh, compensating our employees, retaining employees, dealing with term turnover. A lot of committees deal with that, and we had a little piece of that puzzle. Um, and what I wanted to do today is to talk about those sort of issues on a national level rather than just our uh, little community level. So I'm going to show you a few results on the impact of the Affordable Care Act on incentives in the labor market and ultimately labor market performance. But before we get started, um, I think we got to remember that the, the Affordable Care Act is a complex piece of legislation. And my expertise really lies only in the parts of the act that relate to the labor market generally. I'm not going to have anything to say to you today about, for example, the labor market for physicians. A lot of you might be interested in that. There are a lot of MDs here today, right? It's a good place for me to have a heart attack if I'm going to have one. Um, we'll come back to that kind of reasoning. Um, but really, I'm not an MD, I'm not a biologist, and so I, I don't have anything to tell you about um, what the law is going to do to the health of our population, which is a, an important topic. Um, so that means that the results I'm going to show you today, they don't really tell us by themselves whether the law is a, a good idea or not. Um, I hope somebody's going to combine some dollar estimates of the types of costs and benefits I look at today with dollar estimates of the costs and benefits of the health consequences of the law, and then we could have kind of a bottom line conclusion. But I don't have that for you today. Now, I understand this is not 
uh, an audience of economists. Um, so I wanted to start with a little introduction on the economic concept of tax distortions. And that refers to the fact that businesses and households adjust or change, sometimes we say distort their decisions in order to reduce the taxes they pay and or enhance the subsidies they receive. And I thought it'd be good to have an example. Um, ethanol subsidies, now, they're, now they've become mandates. Uh, these are these were subsidies where gasoline refiners were given a tax credit on the basis of how many gallons of ethanol they produced. And naturally it encouraged refiners to make ethanol. Now a lot of ethanol is produced with corn. So the credit encouraged farmers to use their land for corn that would go into ethanol rather than using their land to make food for people or for livestock. Um, the tax credit raised food prices and all the consequences that go with higher food prices. Um, the people who use fuel used it differently as a consequence of the credit. More likely to use ethanol in their engine than uh, regular gasoline. And that has consequences. Corrosion of the engine and fuel economy and things like that. So these are examples of tax distortions because there are changes to behavior for tax reasons or subsidy reasons rather than behavior based on purely business and personal reasons. Another example we're going to talk about today closer to, to the Affordable Care Act will be the uh, decision of some businesses to push their employee work schedules down to 29 hours a week. And they're, to, to the extent they do so they're doing it not for business and personal reasons of their employees, they're doing it to avoid an IRS penalty. And that's another example of a tax distortion. Tax distortion is another thing you should recognize from economics. There, it's not a linear relationship. Um, a 10% tax is more than twice as damaging as a 5% tax. So that, that influences some of our thinking about tax distortions. Sometimes we call it a tax wedge. Now let's remember that that sounds kind of gloomy about taxes. But none of this means that we shouldn't have taxes and we shouldn't have subsidies. It just means that the taxes and subsidies need to generate sufficient benefits to justify the sorts of costs of the tax distortions with the ethanol or the, in particular the uh, labor market distortions I'm going to talk about today. Now there are four types of provisions in the Affordable Care Act, I'm going to call it the ACA to save a little breath from now on, um, that affect the supply of and demand for labor. The first I'm going to list is the uh, large employer mandate. And it penalizes employers, large employers who don't offer insurance. What's going to be important for the analysis of tax distortions is the way the penalty is figured. It's in particular, it's levied on the basis of the number of full-time employees. More full-time employees, it's going to mean who aren't uh, covered, it's going to mean more penalty. The second, uh, not necessarily in order, second provision is the known as the individual mandate that people um, households and individuals, they need to buy insurance for their family or get a hardship waiver or pay a fine on the basis of their income and family size. They got three choices under this rule, one of those three. The third provision, and we'll see, can be the biggest, are personal income tax credits that are awarded to families so that their health expenses are affordable. I put that in quotes because there's a legal definition of affordable here. Um, what's going to be important for our purposes, two aspects of this are going to be important. Again, it's how is the credit calculated? Two aspects are important. Number one, it's based on household income. 
The more income the household has, the less credit they're going to get. This, the other thing that's important, I've listed it third here, is regardless of your household income, how low or not low it might be, if your employer already offers you affordable coverage, you don't get any credit. Zero, regardless of how high or low your income may be. So that's going to figure into the incentives and the distortions we're, we're going to look at. And the, the fourth uh, group of provisions in the law relate to Medicaid eligibility, expanding it in a, in a few different ways on the basis of income and uh, asset testing. So I think it, to get inside this complexity and organize a little bit, I think it helps to think of the economy at first in terms of three sectors. And that's why I put a pie in here with three pieces. On the bottom would be, um, you might call it a sector, the home sector or the non-market sector. It represents people who are not working for pay. On the left are going to be sectors where employers usually offer health insurance coverage to their employees. And the education sector would be a great example there. And the University of Chicago would be the number one supplier in that sector, of course. Um, and then on the right, we have sectors where health coverage is not offered all that often. And the restaurant industry, especially smaller restaurants or not chain restaurants would be a good example there. Now I've drawn some arrows in here to represent the economic forces that will be put in place um, by the law. The law is going to tend to push people down out of both types of business sectors into not working, and I'll show you how that works, and it also tend to push people from left to right. And the big question is what are the size of the economic forces represented by the arrows. How, how much force is represented there? Now we economists don't, unlike the physicists, we don't measure forces in newtons or something like that. We measure it in terms of the amount that these forces are distorting market prices. And what I'm going to do is, in this slide is give you a few examples you won't understand yet where these numbers come from, but I'll give you a few examples of the size of the forces measured that way. So the first entry I have here is a 30, this is measured in logs, a 30 log point wedge between employer cost and employee benefit in the market for low skill labor. Put it another way, maybe less technical terms, the law is going to increase employer costs about 30% relative to employee benefits. So if employee benefits were constant, that means employer costs would go up 30%. Or if employer costs were constant, that means employee benefits would go down 30%. It's introducing that kind of gap. And you can see kind of how that works. If we're going to be increasing employer costs or reducing employee benefits, we're going to have less jobs and less employees. Uh, employers don't like costly jobs, and employees don't like jobs that have few benefits. Now some, some of the tax distortions that you may have in the law, ethanol might not be a good example, but some distortions are intended. That the view of policymakers is that certain activities aren't happening enough and we want to push activity in, in the right direction. And there's some of that going on with the Affordable Care Act. In particular, I think policymakers think that not enough people have insurance. So I want to push uh, the labor market in the direction of having more insurance. Okay, but that's not what I'm going to talk about next. What I'm going to talk about next is how that push is not uniform across different types of workers. An example, let me show you the result, that the law is going to reduce what I call the skill premium um, by 18 log points, about 20 percent, um, for employers who have insurance that they offer versus employers who don't. Maybe an example I like to use is uh, 
the laws in California for water. In California, if you're a farmer, you get one price for water, practically free. And if you're just a homeowner with a bathtub, you get another price for water. And it's one thing to say, oh, I want to help farmers. But what you're doing, what they do with that law is they're encouraging, giving their farmers to help in a very specific way, which is water. In fact, the farmers aren't even allowed to resell their water to the people with the bathtubs. So you get an inefficient use of water um, that isn't necessary just for the goal of helping farmers. It's the same sort of thing here. We're going to have an inefficient use of labor that isn't necessary from an economic point of view. I'm no expert on politics and what it takes to pass laws, but isn't necessary from the point of view of getting the sectors that have insurance to expand relative to the sectors that don't. And then the th third types of distortions are going to be costs. Employers, some types of employers are going to see their costs go up. Others are going to see their costs go down. And this isn't about general inflation here. It's about relative costs. And when employers have their costs changed, they're going to pass that on to their customer. Ultimately, customers are going to pay those costs. And so what I've shown here is that these are for selected sectors. Um, some sectors are going to see their costs, and ultimately what they have to charge their customers, go up by 12%. Um, others less. Others will see their costs go down. So now you're going to see sectors expanding and contracting as the customers experience these cost changes. And we'll look at those as well. So these are pretty big changes. I wasn't talking about a 1% change in, in a price in the labor market or a price in the market for goods. We're talking about dozens of percent changes in prices. And these large wedges, they're going to have consequences. Don't expect all these new incentives to come in place and people just to continue business as usual. It's not, it's not going to happen. There are going to be a lot of consequences. Big wedges are going to have consequences for the size of the labor market, for um, the importance of different sectors in the economy, not only the issue of whether people work or not, but what type of work are they going to be doing, how are employees getting paid, how's their compensation structured, what's going to be the amount of their compensation, the law is going to impact that, and impact the amount the government spends and the size of the deficit. So these are consequences of these wedges. Now I'm going to drill down a little deeper. I kind of threw some numbers at you. I'm going to drill down a little deeper and explain to you where do these incentives come from, and then we can look at the behavior. So I think of these in two parts. First are the incentives. What are the size of the forces being put in place in the economy? And then the second question is, how will people react? It's like. If you're into boating, it would be a question of how, far, how hard is the wind blowing? And then what's going to happen to my boat? Those are separate questions, and the first one you want to know is how, how hard is the wind blowing? Okay, so we're going to drill into that 30 log point number, the wedge between employer costs and employee benefit. Um, we're going to drill into that and show you how that works. What's going to happen to most of the middle class is going to see their reward to work eroded. Even though the reward to work varies a lot across people. It depends on the type of job you have, it depends on where you live, how big your family is, um, how much your spouse earns. It depends on a lot of things, but um, it turned out the, the act kind of hits people no matter where they fall. Um, and I'm going to show you a few places they might fall. One place people might fall is they might be in a type of job where there tends to be employer insurance. And those people were going to see their reward to work eroded as well. And the, way, and the reason that is, remember I said that the tax credits to help you pay for your health expenses, premiums and out-of-pocket costs, you can't get those if you're on the payroll of a business that offers health insurance. You can't get them. But the moment you leave the payroll, now you can get them. Or if you're out of work and you join the payroll of such a business that offers health insurance, your credits are going to stop. So this is a new form of kind of unemployment insurance, or in general not working insurance, uh, assistance. These are subsidies that if you're this type of worker, you only get during times when you're not working. And that's going to be, that's going to reduce the reward for working and reduce the pain from not working. You can look at it either way, um, it's the same thing. 
Now, not everybody works in an employer who offers insurance. That's why we have the law in the first place, I, I suppose. Um, so let's look at those people. What about people who, when they're working, their employer doesn't have a plan for them, so they're going to go on these exchanges and buy insurance. They're going to be eligible depending on their family income. If it's below 400% of the poverty line, they're going to be eligible for a subsidy. But let's remember how the subsidy is calculated. It's based on the household income. The more the family earns, the less help they're going to get. And it turns out, and I'm going to show you some more detail on this, we'll drill down here as well, that every dollar a family earns in this category will cost them over 20 cents in lost assistance um, for health expenses. On top of all the other taxes that they pay as a consequence of, of working more. And then the third category, some people have employer insurance, some people have exchange partners, some people be uninsured. One can argue about how many, but there will be still some people uninsured. But they're affected as well because there's the individual mandate there. And remember the three things, one of three things you had to, cho you had to choose as an individual. Either get yourself insured, be in hardship, or pay the penalty. Well, un unemployment, of course, is a hardship. So starting next year, being unemployed will give you relief from that penalty. And that's going to be an extra kind of assistance for people who are unemployed. Or you want to look at it the other way, it's an extra thing that workers have to pay if you're in this third category. So pretty much whatever bucket you fall in as a worker or a potential worker, the law is going to be eroding uh, your reward to work and your losses from not working. This is, uh, I, I mentioned the pretty much the number one set of provisions relates to the tax credits. Here's a table on how the tax credits work. Um, this is assuming, again, you don't have an employer's offering insurance. It's based on your household income. Each row represents a household income range. And here I haven't expressed household income in dollars per year. It's probably the most familiar way you are. It's, you're most familiar at seeing incomes that way. Here I've measured it as a ratio to the federal poverty line which depends on your family size. But when you do it this way, you can, uh, you can use the same table regardless of how big the family is. Now, the federal poverty line, again, it depends on the family size. Think of it as roughly $20,000. So four times the federal poverty line would be like $80,000, varying on the family size. Twice the poverty line would be like $40,000. And I have two columns here. In the first column, uh, indicates how much the family will owe in health insurance premiums. There's a cap on what they're going to owe and a fairly low uh, cap. Take, for example, in the first row, if your family's at 105% of the poverty line and you purchase one of these plans, you'll be asked to pay no more than 2% of your income toward the premium. Now, the rest of the premium will be paid for by the government. So you'll send in your premium check, the government will send in a premium check on your behalf so that the insurer gets the full premium. The second set of assistance that people may get, depending on their family income, is with the out-of-pocket costs. These plans will involve, in fact, that's part of their design, that people will have some out-of-pocket costs when they go to the doctor. They may pay something, they'll have a deductible based on individuals and families and so on. But if your family income is low, you're going to get discounts on these out-of-pocket costs. And the size of the discount depends on your family income. So when I, what I've done next is add together these two types of assistance. They're both assistance in dollars, so we can pretty much add them up. Um, at least on an average point of view, we can add them up. Individuals may have different health situations, um, different propensity to visit the health care services, and then they would emphasize these columns differently. But on average, we can add them up. And that's what I've done here. Now the household income that I showed in rows, it showed horizontally here in a graph. Um, I didn't show it infinitely to the right, but basically everything that happens after 4 still applies to people at 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 times the uh, poverty line. 
There's not an exact number for the dollar amount assistance you get. There's a little bit of a range that depends on how old your family is and things like that. So I've shown the range here in, in blue and red. Um, so there is a little bit of a range. The vertical axis is also measured as a ratio of the poverty line. So again, you want to convert it to dollars, you have to multiply by the poverty line for your uh, family size, roughly $20,000. And we can see that the, as the household income rises, the assistance rises. And when you get to 400% of the poverty line, the assistance stops altogether. And that's why I've indicated in the right here that these people are paying full price. Technically, that's not right because um, a lot of people have insurance through an employer and that has a tax advantage. We're going to put that to the side for a second. We actually can put it aside, as I'll explain later. Um, so, but for now, we're going to call that full price. So one thing I've just read in the San Francisco Chronicle today, uh, finance, uh, a personal finance columnist explaining to people, you know what, if your income's around in here, you might want to think about ways of earning less because you're going to no longer have to pay full price for your health insurance. And she did a good job of explaining, maybe not from the Treasury's point of view, she didn't do a good job of explaining, but from the reader's point of view, she did a good job of explaining how that works. So what happens if you spend more time unemployed, more time on maternity leave, working part-time rather than full-time? That's going to reduce your family income and you're going to move down this scale and you're going to get less assistance. On an average, this is the same number I mentioned earlier, on average for every dollar of family income you give up, you're going to get back 20 to 25 cents in terms of um, assistance with your health expenses. I say on average because you can see the line has got a lot of wiggles in it. Um, and that's on the average. Some of these ranges, like the range that was the lady in the San Francisco Chronicle was writing about, can be quite, quite a bit bigger, other ranges smaller. But on average, uh, 20 to 25 percent would be lost. Now this, is, this applies only to workers who are getting their health insurance on the exchanges. Remember, if you're getting health insurance from your employer, you don't use this scale. You don't get tax credits. But if you're working on the exchanges and you work less or you work more, you're going to see your assistance adjust accordingly. So sometimes I call this sliding down, sliding down the scale or sliding up the scale based on decisions and outcomes for people in the labor market. But now let's work at workers who have insurance. By all estimates, more people will have insurance on their job than people who will be participating in these exchange plans. It's a big part. Maybe 40% of the workforce or something like that has insurance on their job. What about their incentives? Well, as long as they're working, they're paying full price. With that caveat I mentioned earlier, they're paying full price. The moment they stop working, they're put on the schedule. Where are they put on the schedule? On the point that corresponds to their family income. So the moment they leave that job, the subsidy turns on. Um, and the moment they go back to that job or a similar job, the subsidy turns off. So I call that jumping onto the scale, um, as opposed to sliding along it that some people will do if they have exchange plans when they're working. These guys will jump onto the scale. They can jump onto the scale, as I mentioned, by quitting, being laid off, to jump off the scale by accepting a new job. But there's another way to jump onto the scale in many cases, which is going to be by working part-time. Um, when you're on, even if a lot of employers, I actually forget how the University of Chicago does, a lot of employers, they offer health insurance only to their full-time employees. Part-timers don't get it. If you were to switch positions, even staying with your employer from full-time to part-time, you'd lose your eligibility for the employer insurance, meaning you would turn on your eligibility for these subsidies. So that's going to be another way to jump onto the scale, um, and that's what I wanted to show you next. To give you an idea of the big bucks that are involved with jumping onto the scale. So this is just an example. This doesn't represent everyone in America. There are actually millions of different outcomes for Americans, and we crunch those by computer, but it's an example um, that we can learn a lot from. And in this example, I want to consider a specific person who's deciding 
or thinking about, or maybe their employer is deciding or thinking about, should they work part-time or full-time? So I'm going to start with the employee costs of that decision. First of all is the hours work. If you work full-time, you've agreed to be at work, um, doing work more hours. So here I'm going to say 40 hours. The part-time position has lesser costs. You only have to work um, 29 hours. I'm also factored in work expenses, something like a commuting cost. If you're only working three days a week, there's less bus pass you have to buy or less train tickets you have to buy or less gas for your car you have to buy for the purpose of working. So I have put that in as well. Those are on a weekly basis, so 40 hours per week and $100 per week. The results in this table are for the year 2014. One reason I chose that year is because it's coming real soon. The other reason I chose it is there are no employer penalties next year. So just to be clear to everybody, what I'm going to show you in this table has nothing to do with the employer penalty because it's for next year when there are none. There's some fascinating stuff in this table as it is. We don't need to put in employer penalties yet. Now let's look at employer costs. Um, these first row is on an hourly basis. Both these types of employees in this example are going to cost the employer $26 an hour. And I said that's just an example. We're not talking about a minimum wage worker here though. A lot of these type, types of calculations, if you've seen them before, or you remember back when you took economics, you saw these type of calculations, they're often done for pretty poor people, people in minimum wage jobs. This is not anything close to a minimum wage uh, job. It's not super rich, but it's not uh, minimum wage either. So this employee is going to cost $26 an hour either way. The annual compensation, of course, is less for the part-time employee because the part-time employee doesn't work as much. Part-time employee only costs 37.7 as opposed to 52,000. If you're following along with the arithmetic, I've shown in the right column how you calculate one column from another. The next group has to do with health expenses. Now, some of the health expenses, depending on the situation, are for the employer, some for the employee, some for the government. And Either way, under, under either position, I assume that health expenses are going to be on an annual basis. I'm thinking of a family of four here, 17,300. What's different between the two scenarios is how that 17,300 gets paid for. Under the full-time scenario, a lot of it's getting paid for through the employer insurance. The employer and the employee together are paying it. Um, and some of it comes out of pocket. As you know, employer insurance is not out of pocket expense free. Um, there's some expenses there. Under the part time situation, remember, they're not going to be on the employer insurance. They're going to be on the exchanges. And now how it gets paid for is very different. Overall, in some sense, there's more out of pocket costs. That's kind of the idea of the law. What's really different here is Look what the government kicks in. I've kicked in, in, in the red here, red boxes I've displayed what the government's kicking in. On the full-time position, government kicks in nothing. Um, under the part-time position, the government's kicking in um, 11,000 for premiums and 4,000 for out-of-pocket discounts. Now that, those numbers are based on, as we saw before, the family income relative to the poverty line in this example here, the family income is, because I know the family size, it's 145% of the poverty line. And that's what determines the size of their subsidy. But what's going on here is the decision to go part time rather than full time turns on almost $15,000 worth of subsidies. That goes a long way toward compensating for the income that's lost by working part-time. Remember the 52,000 row. Employee, employee uh, is producing only 37,000 part-time, 52,000 full-time, but the government is a third party kicking in here and helping with 15,000 of that loss. In fact, in this example, the bottom line income that people have after health expenses and after work expenses is actually greater 
when they work part-time than they work full-time. That's new. Under the Affordable Care Act, that's a new situation that can arise when there isn't before the Affordable Care Act. You would have had less income working part-time than full-time. Here you can earn more, and the reason is the subsidies that are turned on. Now this is just an example. I can literally calculate millions of scenarios here, depending on family size, how much employer cost is per hour, what's the ratio to the federal poverty line, those sort of issues, whether the spouse works. But there's a general lesson here. We have a new subsidy that full-time employees can't get. Part-time employees can get it. That changes the calculus of the decision whether to be part-time or full-time worker. This number, you might have noticed that income after taxes is exactly the same under the two scenarios. That's a coincidence. That's part of my example. I tried to make it easy on you guys. If that weren't true, and it could go either way, one could be a little, the right column could be a little bigger, left column, then I'd have to keep track of employee payroll taxes, food stamp benefits, uh, personal income tax, personal income tax to the state government. A lot of stuff have to be kept track of, but the general lesson would remain the ACA is introducing this new and potentially very large um, form of assistance that part-time employees can get and full-time employees can't. And it comes out from, we looked in the previous picture, it comes from jumping onto the scale. You work full-time, you're paying full price. You work part-time, you're not paying full price anymore. Okay, so now we can address the employer penalties, which are due to come in um, in 2015, a little over a year. Now you've probably heard about some of these penalties. Uh, the $2,000 numbers shared a lot. The reality is there are actually three or four penalty categories. One category of penalty is zero. Employers that are small won't owe any penalty. Another category, though, we can't forget about this one, is 40,000. There are employers with 49 employees who will find that hiring the 50th one costs them 40000 a year. Now, of course, there aren't that many employers who have exactly 49 employees, or exactly 50, but when they exist, there's a big number. So if you want to think about averages, you've got to count the 40000 in the average according to how many employers experience it. And then the other number, which would be a very common number, would be employers with more than 50 employees, they're going to owe 2,000 for each additional full-time employee. There's also a 3,000 category, which I don't have time to delve into. So that's the first thing to remember. There are categories of this penalty. The second thing to remember, because they're in dollars, it's tempting to compare them to other dollar figures you may see. But you've got to be careful, because unlike salaries, these penalties are not going to be deductible from business taxes. And let me show you the consequence of that. So I'm going to think of an employer who's going to cut his employee's wages by 3046 and pay in a, a penalty pursuant to the ACA of 2000. I'm going to show you how he's going to have his cash flows held constant there. So okay, the penalty costs him 2000 of course. Cutting wages saves him 3000. But because he cut wages, he's also cutting his payroll tax. Because by definition, the payroll tax is a percentage of his payroll. Smaller payroll, smaller payroll tax. So he saves 233 that way. But by cutting wages, he has less to deduct in calculating his business income tax. Business income tax is your revenue minus your costs, including your labor costs. So he ends up, if he's at a 39% rate, which is a fairly common rate for both corporations and uh, non-corporations, He's going to owe almost $1,300 extra uh, in business tax. So in the end, this $2,000 penalty is 
equivalent to a $3,046 salary cut. So you look at it from the employee's point of view. How much does my employer need to cut my salary to be able to pay this penalty, to justify paying this penalty? It's going to be 3046. So it's really, um, that's why it's, it's boring, I guess, and uh, kind of tedious. But you got to recognize the $2,000 penalty is not really a $2,000 penalty. It's more like $3,000. OK, so those, those are a bunch of provisions that are discouraging people from working full time or working at all. Let me be clear, in this complex piece of legislation, I guess that's the beauty of complex legislation, there's always some exceptions. And I've listed some exceptions here. You know, the law is going to move some people off of uncompensated care that's means tested. There's kind of a sliding scale for uncompensated care. If you go in as an uninsured patient to a hospital and they find out you make a lot of money, they're going to, try, they're going to squeeze some out of you. If they find out you're poor, they might not. Um, the law may, I'm not an expert on this at all, but uh, some people believe the law is going to bend the cost curve. It's going to make insurance cheaper for employers like the University of Chicago that offer insurance to their employees. And that will kind of grease the wheels of the labor market. Um, and there's some other effects that may happen. The good news, at least for somebody like me, we know how to quantify these things as economists. They all have a lot in common with taxes. So we can kind of add them together. Every once in a while, we have to multiply them. We can do that pretty easily. And we've done that. And these things, they're real, but they're an order of magnitude smaller than the disincentives that I just showed you. So I could drag you through the details, but why drag you through the details of something that's ultimately going to be small? I've showed you the kind of details of the big stuff. OK, this is a chart from uh, the op-ed I had in the Wall Street Journal two weeks ago. It's a chart of um, what I call the marginal tax rate on labor income. It's for a typical American worker, when they decide to work, what fraction of their compensation goes to the government in the form of extra taxes or less benefits, less subsidies. And that changes over time. In fact, this index is designed that the only reason it can ever change over time is because there are new laws, new rules for calculating taxes and subsidies. And there have been a variety of legislation that affected this. What's interesting for our purposes today is what happens beginning in January 2014. We have a big increase in the marginal tax rate. It's ultimately, it's going to be five percentage points. On top of the five percentage points, it already increased in the prior, say, five or six years. So where people used to, not too long ago, used to keep 60% on average, talk to me in 18 months from now, they'll be keeping only half, a little less than half. And that's, you compare 60 to 50, that's a, a one-sixth cut in their pay. At least from the point of view, uh, unless wages are something to adjust, that's a one-sixth cut in their pay. As economists, I can't stand here and say, you know what? Business as usual will continue even though people are getting a one-sixth cut in their pay. Can't happen. There has to be uh, some adjustment and some response to, to such a big change. And that, this kind of isn't even fair to, get, to show you the picture, because this is an average. I, I said there are millions of situations out there that are different. And including in, some, in the average going up 10, there's people, or the average going up 5 next year, there's people who are going to experience something different than the average. Um, here's a here's the five points I showed you, kind of for people in the middle, typical situations. And here's for a low-wage worker. Low-wage workers are going to see, on average, among low-wage workers, they're going to see their tax rate go up by almost 11 points. And I find that interesting because low-wage workers tend to be the ones who are more sensitive to these things uh, in terms of their decisions to work um, part-time, full-time, not at all. Now, one reaction to this um, that I hear sometimes is that, hey, as long as people get to keep some of what they earn, they're going to go out and try their hardest to earn it. It's better to get 1% of your pay than nothing. And if you don't work, nothing's what you're getting. And that's a fallacy, number one. 
Number two, it's a red herring, as I'll explain in a minute. It's a fallacy. You know people. Think about it. You know people who don't maximize their income. You guys don't maximize your income. Otherwise, you live in New York City. People make more there. People make sacrifices in their income for other goals, quality of life, whatever you want to call it. Some people do that. Um, and those some people count in the averages. Um, I'm not saying, look, I'm not saying that everybody always adjusts to everything. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying on average, there's going to be adjustments. And the bigger the tax increase you put in front of somebody, the more on average they're going to, they're going to adjust their behavior. It's also partly a red herring that even if it were true that it takes a 100% tax rate to get people to work less, there are people under this new law that will experience a 100% tax rate. And I just showed you an example with the part-time where what did you earn by raising your hours from 29 to 40? Less than nothing. That's a bigger than 100% tax rate. So even if we were, those are the only type of people who are going to react, those people are going to be out there. So either way you look at it, um, you can just expect the labor market to adjust. I can tell you another story, that another ex retort that I hear in addition to the income maximization theory is that they say that, look, when people get fired from their job, they cry, they don't celebrate. And I agree that that usually happens. But it, that's irrelevant, that's another red herring. And I'll, I'll can give you an example maybe that's not so close to home to help you appreciate, help you appreciate that. Uh, now I gotta confess, I never drowned before. I don't know if any of you ever drowned. I never drowned. But I did pull my two-year-old out of the water once when he was drowning. And there's very clear water, I could see on his face, he was terrified. I would bet that that experience was as bad or worse than getting fired. So by that logic, that when you're terrified and you're crying in an event, that that means, that proves that incentives don't matter, then you would conclude that, look, incentives don't matter for drowning either. But we know that's, that's not true. The commander of the Coast Guard over in Michigan, she contacted me and she said, look, Casey, I could give you all kinds of data showing you how incentives matter for drowning. That Boaters in Alaska, where the Coast Guard can't help them because the distances are just too great, boaters in Alaska take care of themselves. They wear the life jackets, they got the radio, they got the lifeboat. They respond to the incentive, which is no help means they're gonna protect themselves. Whereas people in New England or here in Lake Michigan, they never wear their life jacket. They never got the radio, they don't got the lifeboat. And the Coast Guard knows this. The Coast Guard understands that the act of helping people causes them to help themselves less, even though the event at issue is a terrifying one. I saw my son, he was terrified by drowning. So what? It doesn't mean the drowning doesn't respond to incentives. So that's, that's, another, um, that's another red herring. Yes, unemployment is painful. It's painful. But the, the ACA is gonna make it less painful. And maybe we ought to do it for that reason, but let's not pretend that people are going to ignore the new incentives and won't adjust their behavior accordingly. We're going to have more help for people who don't work and thereby more people not working. Now let's look at uh, sectors. So we talked first about the kind of vertical air goes here, the people moving down. Let's talk about people moving from left to right. This, um, there are of course lots and lots of sectors out there, so we need to organize a little bit. I got kind of two ways I want to carve things up. One of them I mentioned to already, the different types of workers. I'm going to put people in kind of two buckets, low skill or high skill. The other way I want to carve up the economy is in terms of the types of insurance that people in the different sectors tend to have or will tend to have. So one group of sectors I call the employer-sponsored sectors, uh, the ESI sectors. The other set of sectors, the second one will be where people tend to be on the exchanges, and the third set of sectors include the uninsured. Actually, that last category is kind of a catch-all, uh, but mainly they're going to be uninsured people. And then, so I can 
so you can appreciate without too much trouble the magnitudes involved here. I'm going to make a few normalizations here. I'm going to assume that employers pay all the taxes. Even their employees' taxes, they pay the taxes. I'm going to do that to simplify it. In economics, one of the results we have, especially in the long run, if not in the short run, it doesn't matter who pays the taxes. Is it the employers and the employees? Is it the customer? Is it the retailer? It doesn't matter who pays it. So to make things easy, I'm going to assume employers uh, pay all these things. In particular, I'm going to assume that everybody, everybody, whether they work or not, the type of job they have, everybody gets an exchange subsidy according to that scale I showed. And then what I'm going to do is for the people who aren't entitled to it according to the law, I'm going to make their employer pay for it. So I'm going to kind of undo the subsidy on the employer side. And all this is for the purpose, it's an intellectual exercise, to be able to add up all these taxes. Because there are so many, if I can put them in one place, we can start to add them up and see, uh, see what's going on with their size. And then the last thing we think about as economists is that there's competition, especially in the long run. The workers are not slaves to their employer. They can work somewhere else, especially in the long run. There can be adjustments on where people apply for new jobs and where they don't apply for jobs. This can contrast okay, some of the discussion you might have heard about employers kind of being conflicted. Should they drop their insurance? Their low skill employees would love that because that will turn on a big subsidy for them. But their high school employees are going to be upset because they're going to lose their tax advantage. Is there, so what are we going to do? Wrestle in front of the water cooler to determine what happens? Economists don't think that way. Then there's competition in the labor market. If you're on an employer who's not giving you a benefit that another employer would give you, you're going to get compensated in cash. That's the nature of competition. Otherwise, you would go to that other employer. So in the end of the day, there's not going to be a conflict. Wages are going to adjust, um, and the structure of compensation will adjust so that uh, workers can agree uh, with, with each other. OK, so now I'm going to go through uh, some of the provisions. Each vertically, I'll go through provisions. Horizontally, I have the sectors here, the ESI sectors, the NGI sectors, and the uninsured sector. The perverse provision I said I, would, I was going to get to it, now finally I've got to it. It uh, has nothing to do with the ACA. The ACA kind of leaves this intact. It's the value of excluding the health premiums from your employer insurance from your personal taxes. You may not have noticed this lately, but the employer premiums you, you pay uh, for your University of Chicago plan, that's subtracted from your income before they calculate your payroll tax, before they calculate your personal income tax. So it's a, it's a, not only is it nice to have the health insurance, but it's also nice to be able to get some of your income out of the reach of those two types of taxes. That provision on average is worth, these numbers I'm going to show you are going to be for low skill people. If, if, you have, if you're in that sector as a low skill person, that's worth about $2,700 a year on average. Counting as zeros, some people here, some of the people in the room maybe, work for the University of Chicago, but you don't have insurance because your spouse has it. Um, and you would be counted as a zero in there. So that, that's an average. The first ACA provision um, is the employer penalty. I mentioned it was 2000. I, I made two adjustments here. One is the adjustments we talked about that the business taxes, the $2,000 penalty also creates some business tax liabilities. And the other adjustment I've made is, you know, not everybody works full time. And that penalty only falls on full time workers. So on average, that penalty is 2,600. What sectors does it apply to? Well, that's where the yeses are here. What only applies to the NGI and the uh, unemployed, uh, uninsured sectors? Then jumping ahead, the exchange subsidy. Remember how we are rigid here? All, everybody gets it, and then some employers have to pay it back. Which ones have to pay it back? Well, the employers who offer insurance have to pay it back because their employees weren't entitled to it. And then the employers who have employees who don't get any insurance, or maybe, maybe you're on Medicaid or something, they don't get it either, so it's clawed back from them. And then uh, finally, the individual mandate, that applies only to people, workers who aren't insured. So now we can add these up. Basically what I do is every time there's a yes for a sector, I say, okay, this sector's got two yeses. 
or, or three yeses. So I got three numbers to add. And the total tax on the employer there is about 7,600. In the second column, there's only one yes. The total uh, tax there is 2,600. In the third column, there's again three yeses. The sum there is about 14,000. The important point is not the amount, the overall level of these numbers, because I said we're kind of rigging it to put it all on the employer side so we can do some addition. What's important is look how different they are for the different types of employers. They're ranging from 2,600 to 14,000. That's going to be one of these things like the farmers get the cheap water and the people with the bathtubs get the expensive water. It's going to be some of the sectors are going to get low skill employees cheaply, other sectors are going to get them, have to pay a lot for them. That's going to uh, create some inefficiencies. The Department of Health and Human Services, what do they say about all this? I just showed you a bunch of pretty large incentives. One sector is paying 14,000, other sector is only paying 2,600. Uh, some people have seen their marginal tax rates go up 10 percentage points. Some people have seen them going beyond 100%. I keep saying, look, that's got to affect behavior. But what does the Department of Health and Human Services say? They say, well, nope, our law, the ACA, is going to improve affordability and accessibility of health care without significantly affecting the labor market. What's up with that? Well, they looked at Massachusetts. How did they get that conclusion? They said they looked at Massachusetts. Massachusetts also had a health reform. Some people call it Romney Care. They had a health reform. And in Massachusetts, you barely saw any change in the labor market. Now, I agree. I've looked at Massachusetts. You barely see any change in the labor market relative to the rest of the country. Now, Romney Care came in right before a terrible recession, so lots of things happened in Massachusetts, but they tended to happen in other states as well. So you don't see effect, uh, any kind of significant effect economically or statistically for that matter, um, effect in Massachusetts after Romney Care. I agree with that uh, evaluation of Massachusetts and of Romney Care. The mistake, I think, is Romney Care and the ACA are not the same thing. The, all the exercise I just took you through for the ACA, you could do it for Romney Care. Those numbers don't really care whether it's Romney Care or Obamacare, and we could do that. I've done it. And it turns out there are a lot of differences. One difference is the Massachusetts health reform. Really, it's designed to leverage the federal tax exclusion. It made sense from a state point of view. They don't really care about the federal budget. State point of view, let's try to achieve our goals with federal do dollars. And the way they did that, and it was, I can see the sense in it, they tried to leverage the federal tax exclusion to make the feds pay for it, kind of, um, without actually agreeing to it. The employer penalty under the Affordable Care Act is 11 times greater than the Massachusetts health reform penalty. It's not the same penalty, it's 11 times greater. They both have penalties, I guess, that's interesting but their orders of magnitude different. The Massachusetts health reform did not introduce any subsidized coverage for unemployed people. As I explained, the Affordable Care Act is doing that. Um, and then the last point I'll emphasize is Massachusetts is, is a different in terms of the number of high school people they have, the propensity of firms to author health insurance even without the reform, those are all different and you need to account for those. And here's how I account for them. Here's the five percentage point increase in the marginal tax rate I showed you. I showed you a couple times now. That's the effect of the ACA and the marginal tax rate in the United States of America. Here's the effect of Romney Care on the marginal tax rate in Massachusetts. 0.4 versus 5.0, factor of, I think it's 12 difference. So the size of the economic forces in the ACA are an order of magnitude bigger than the size of the forces uh, in Massachusetts, measured on a per capita basis. I already recognize that Massachusetts is a smaller place, but on a per capita basis, the forces in the ACA are order of magnitude bigger. So conclusions, the uh, ACA sharply reduces the reward to work, 
It introduces large wedges by sector and skill. Um, I got to believe the labor market is going to shrink significantly. How much? I, we haven't finished that yet. But I can tell you that I don't see any way the labor market to get back to the way it was in 2007 as long as the tax rates don't get back to what they are in 2007. And what's happening with the ACA is tax rates are going further away from where they are in 2007, up beyond 50% rather than back down to 40. Um, it'll reduce productivity. That has a lot to do with the sectoral shifts I skipped over. There are going to be a bunch of surprises here. I think we'll be surprised in how many people leave ESI, employer-sponsored insurance. I think we'll also be surprised, you might call this a pleasant surprise, on how many people are going to be insured. Because a lot of these wedges are pushing in the direction of the insured not, rather than uninsured. And the budget projectors haven't accounted for that yet. So that means the program will be more expensive than they thought. Also, for the physicians here, you want to know what's going to happen to the demand for health care. You've got more people with insurance. Maybe you'll have more demand for health care as well. Maybe you'll be busy. Maybe you'll be highly paid. We'll see. Um, but I think people have underestimated, um, by not bringing in the tax distortions, people have underestimated what's going to happen next. So it'll only take a couple of years, and we'll be able to settle this uh, in a historical way. But for now, that, those are the prognosis from an uh, economist's point of view. Thank you. Let me ask the first question. About three days ago in the Wall Street Journal, Zeke Emanuel uh, published a paper arguing against this labor shift uh, towards part-time work. And he cited data from the last uh, 12 to 18 months suggesting that no one has seen such a shift occur yet. Um, I don't know if you saw that particular paper. Yeah, I've heard that argument. I didn't see that uh, particular column. but. What I find strange about the argument is these economic forces that I'm telling you about, they don't start until January of, 14. So, of, of 2014. So why should I see them in behavior last year or something like that? I don't understand why, why they're even looking there. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, do, I know that you hear from employers saying, here and there, saying, right now, here in 2013, I've changed the way I'm doing business. I'm putting people down to 29. I mean, that's kind of employers talking. I don't really listen when they talk. I watch what they do. <laughs> and so that, uh, Emmanuel's approach, I appreciate. If, if he's going to go to the data and systematically measure what employers are doing, that's good. Let's systematically measure it. But that's understanding how economics works. When the force is off, people don't react to it. When the force is on, people will. So we need to come back, I think, in two years and, and measure these things and have the conversation. Good. Thank you. The first one is. Oh. Yes, sorry. David. We, we were Okay, okay. Oh, you have two microphones. Got it. Okay. So, two questions. The first one is, in your list of potential countervailing um, forces, you mentioned bending the cost curve. I want to ask about a related issue, which is sort of shifting the cost burden. So, you know, a lot of private health insurance pays the cost of the uninsured, for example. So, have you done similar estimates for that cost shift? and the associated incentives that would come from lowering the price of private insurance because more people are insured? That's the first question. I can ask the second or wait. Yeah, I, I had that in a different bullet, but that effect I called it moving people off uncompensated care. I see. That, okay. I've accounted for that. I mean, and that's also the order of magnitude lower. Right? Yeah, I mean, okay. you, how much is uncompensated care I don't know, on an annual basis? 30 yeah. billion or something? I don't know the exact number. Compared to the nation's labor income, yeah, it's small. It's, it's small. Okay, so then here's the, the second question. So we have a history, of course, of changing tax policy over time, partially in response to things like people not working. <laughs> so is there a possible compensatory response to this, where people see that you're right, people stop working, and what we do is we change marginal tax rates for the people who are most affected by this, and presumably come up with the money somewhere else which presumably has got to be raising taxes for the rich because you can't take it from money that people don't have. I spent a lot of time thinking about the policy response to this. Here I just say, look, if we have this law and we follow it as written, here's the economic forces. But I wonder, are they going to adjust that? I'm not sure the direction. There's a certain point of view that whenever employment goes down, we need to respond by giving more money to people who don't work and that'll just make it go down more. 
Now, maybe it's the right response and a compassionate response, but as an economist trying to predict what's going to happen in the labor market, I, I don't know what direction these feedbacks go. I, I'm watching them very closely, though. And I, I'm not very confident that I can tell you how many copies of my book sold. There's not many. <laughs> There's not enough people reading about the basic economics of these sorts of rules. And so there's a lot of denial out there that these things affect the labor market. And so when the labor market goes down, it's going to be blamed on something else. It's going to be blamed on Europe. It's going to be blamed on the shutdown. It's going to be blamed on debt default, whatever, stock market. Stock market's not going to enjoy this type of journey. Stock market go down, they'll blame it on that. And then we got to you know, have more funds for people who are out of work. Uh, Elbert. So inter internationally, we know that uh, other countries have much stronger social support systems. Are people lazier in Canada? OK, first of all, I never said that people were lazy. In fact, my view is people are what they are. Their personalities don't change, but they're presented with different circumstances. OK, so I'm not saying that people are going to get lazy. I'm going to say same people, equally not lazy, equally hardworking, new circumstances. OK, economists for years have been looking at the European economy and saying, look, they present their people with different circumstances. That's why they've traditionally had more unemployment, less hours of work, because of the different rules they have. Um, now, I've been so busy with America, I haven't been able to keep up to date, but I kind of think our tax rates may actually be going beyond Europe's. Um, anyway, that's something we can work out, and we can, we can measure. what's. What's going on with European tax rates? How do they compare to the United States tax rates? And eventually, when we're at the point where we have the same tax rates, I can expect we're more or less act the same. Um, first, I'm going to say I'm, a, I'm one of these skilled re workers. I'm a registered nurse retired. Um, so I'm, I have a little bit of interest in health care and have seen people who needed health care. Uh, this is very enlightening to me. So that the fact is that if people can get out of working and can get their needs taken care of, then they won't work. And so social safety nets really stop people from working. In addition to which, people are going to be, who lose their jobs or who can't work, who haven't had jobs, are going to be able to sit down and figure all this out. Oh, wow, if I cut my hours to 10, I will really, really, really be sitting in the catbird seat. I'm not an economist, so maybe this is too much of uh, uh, feeling. But somehow or other, my mind does not pick this up too well. Well, first of all, neither I nor econo economics says that everybody reacts to everything. Okay, There are some people who won't react, but some people will. We're talking about the averages. If you're interested in national analysis, you're interested in averages. Now, maybe national analysis is boring, and I ought to be studying just your neighbor, whatever. But, National analysis includes all the people, and some of them are going to react. That's not my insight into how brains work. That's the result of prior research on prior public programs and safety net programs and unemployment programs in Europe and America and South America. And that's a result, that the average amount of work is less, the less the reward for working is. That's, that's been an empirical result. Now, maybe those results are different. We have a different kind of humanity now than we used to. Good luck with that. But my view is people are kind of like they used to be. And when you put them in circumstances where they're not rewarded well, don't expect them to respond real well on average. Please. Uh, you've described what some people describe as a, a compassionate program or a, a safety net program. That's a program that de-incentivizes uh, the, uh, the workers. Uh, could I extend that to parents who save their children from drowning, de-incentivizing the uh, uh, need to learn to swim uh, or the need to have swim training? The, uh, no doubt about that. The, the I mean, the Coast Guard recognizes that they're de-incentivizing people from protecting themselves, but the Coast Guard's not standing up and saying, get rid of the Coast Guard. They understand that there's a trade-off. And the fact that there are a trade-off doesn't mean you want to go to an extreme and say, 
let's give, let's do everything for efficiency. Let's give up all compassion, all assistance, because efficiency is the only goal. It's not an only goal. It's a trade-off. And all I'm pointing out is I started with that scale, okay? There are different objectives in life, and we have to balance them. And I'm just showing you one part of the scale, which is labor market costs. And they may be more than justified by the health gains you get, or maybe you view redistribution as a good thing. Maybe the redistribution you achieve is more than justified for the cost you create. I'm just pointing out the cost, and I said, please, let's add up the cost and the benefits and get to the final answer. But let's not, because we like the benefits, let's not present, pretend the costs are non-existent. It seemed to me in one of your slides, when, when you were looking at the costs to the employer, you didn't take into account this 25% drop in, in productivity for moving from 40, to 29, 40 hours to 29 hours. I, I didn't see that in your calculation. That is, in addition to the exchanges that you described, presumably the employee hour is making a contribution to the employer's bottom line. But that kind of cancels because so he he saved thirteen thousand on his payroll, but he also lost thirteen thousand in production. So that kind of cancels. I see. Okay, please. Um, this is just about your calculations. Have, does did you factor in like an employee an employee's incentive to save, like in four hundred one k's? or to raise, so if they get a higher salary or they're bringing in more salary, they have the potential to save for their future and they might also have the potential to get higher social security benefits far into the future. I mean, would that factor into an individual's incentives to work or not to work in the present? Well, a lot of those incentives were there before the Affordable Care Act and will be there after. And so, so that degree, they kind of cancel in the calculation. We do look at kind of savings before retirement. Uh, almost all these programs I mentioned don't apply once you hit the 65. Then you're on Medicare. You would have been on Medicare without the act. You're on the Medicare with the act. You don't get the subsidies. You would get an employer penalty if you worked on an employer as an elderly person. Um, so the, employer, the penalty would apply, but most of the stuff doesn't apply. So for that reason, we haven't looked a lot about what people, how people are going to kind of enter retirement as a consequence of this stuff. It's something important to look at. It's also important to look at from the perspective of, are we going to see a Medicare reform on the heels of this reform? And will that disincentivize people from saving in their 401k? And it's great questions I haven't really worked on. I know the questions are there for somebody to tackle, though. We'll make this the last question. Ed Dunn, I'm a physician from Lexington, Kentucky, and a McLean Fellow here. Um, what about the effect of eight, the AC on, on uh, workforce productivity? You know, we, we know that health, having health insurance access is a social determinant for health. People live longer. Medicaid, private sector insurance, uh, have, those data would support that. And so what about the fact that if people, if more people have health insurance who are in the workforce, albeit 29 hours per week, if they're healthier and have less sick leave, then perhaps be more productive. Also, what about the, um, the, the health economy sector itself? You know, 18 to 30 year olds, 25, 30% underinsured today. A third of the patients we see in our emergency rooms have no health insurance. And we know that all those, uh, those that's all paid for by us who have helped through our health care premiums, as well as by government, as well as by the health care providers, with those who provide health care, like the University of Chicago. So I'm thinking about the beneficial effects of workforce productivity in the labor market, and also I'm thinking about the healthcare economy, which could be booming as a result of this, this new law. Now, the uncompensated care is real, I mean, but I brought that in, okay? I recognize that an offset to everything I had, and it was included in my overall Wall Street Journal number, includes a subtraction for the uncompensated care effect. But when you're talking to $30 billion in an economy that generates $12 trillion in labor income, it's not a hell of an offset. Um, now, your first point was about the productivity of people in the workplace. Most of the workplace already is insured, okay? So this productivity effect you're talking about can only work through that small chunk of the workplace that is uninsured, number one. Number two, there aren't that many sick days in a year, even for those people. There are some, okay? Number three, 
I don't, I'm not sure the Affordable Care Act will completely eliminate sick days for such people. So you're only going to shave off a part of the sick days, which is a small part of the year, which is a small part of the overall workforce, and you get a number in the direction you're talking about, but it's pretty small. And we know how to add all this stuff up, and that's definitely something we've brought in. Now, the healthcare sector is probably going to boom. There are other sectors that maybe boom. Boom's a little strong, but grow. But those are people moving from other sectors. They're going to shrink, and customers moving from other sectors. You know, when these resources, the resources aren't coming from heaven, as far as I know. Somebody's going to pay taxes or buy government bonds to pay for these subsidies. They're going to pay for health care, and they're not going to buy other stuff, whether it be luxury hotels or new automobiles or what have you. So that's kind of a shift. It's a shift we kind of want to keep track of, but it's a, it's a shift, not an overall increase in the national pie. Can you take one more? Yeah, I got, I got it. There's one in the middle. Yeah. We'll make this our last question. You said redistribution a minute ago. Could you just um, say a few more words on that? Well, there's one point of view that the rich people have too much money and the poor people don't have enough, and we actually feel good when we redistribute, like Robin Hood felt good about what he did. And if you want to count that as a benefit, okay, count it as a benefit. It would, but let's not pretend the costs are zero. I mean, the costs are there. So how are things, what's being distributed here? Money. From people earning above 400% of the poverty line to people below, from people earning 350% of the poverty line down to people earning 200% of the poverty line. For people who are uninsured toward people who already have insurance. Redistribution is kind of the flip side of all these economic forces that when you, if you're going to incentivize people not to work, one benefit is you're going to be helping people who aren't working and, and vice versa. No, no, I, I'm going to call the questions. Okay. <laughs> uh, I want to thank Casey so thank much. You. Thank you so much. Well, thanks, Mark.